I share my screen uh, just so I can get, we can all get started. All right, so um, as Dave mentioned, my name is Dr. Kenneth Armijo, I'm a systems engineer at Sandia National Labs. And I'm gonna be talking today about uh, some really exciting research that we're doing with next generation concentrating solar power for the 21st century. Um, so I grew up in a small town in New Mexico, from New Mexico uh, called Sabinal, a uh, third generation chili farmer and um, have had the pleasure of being able to see how technology can evolve from something as simple as tractors on a farm, all the way to space shuttles at NASA, to now the next generation concentrating solar power to uh, help people have energy. <clears throat> and um, just showing some pictures of kind of as you keep going through school, going to college, getting your degrees in engineering and, and STEM, you can get to train astronauts on a space shuttle as shown here, uh, experience microgravity, get to help launch uh, spacecraft into space and get to work on really exciting projects in solar power. And in addition, get to also do really cool startup companies uh, uh, such as with solar hot water heaters in developing countries and also uh, really neat wireless health monitoring systems, kind of like Fitbits uh, that I also was able to do. Uh, this is where I work at the Sandia National Laboratory's National Solar Thermal Test Facility, or NSTTF. Uh, I have a little tour at the end. We're going to do a virtual tour of this whole place, um, which is really exciting place to work. Uh, I get to work with this 300 foot tall uh, solar tower with all these mirrors. Uh, to concentrate light onto a tower and produce energy. So if any of you have ever played with a magnifying glass in the sun and burn little things on the ground, uh, this is taking it to a whole nother extreme level where we get to actually use all of that type of mindset for producing power as well as also fresh water. So these are some of the various uh, facilities and laboratories we have at the NSTTF. Uh, for doing the work uh, that we do in solar energy. Our place, uh, the NSCTF, has had a long lineage. It's been around for over 40 years, and we've been able to do research that has been able to start all of these power plants all over the world uh, over the last few decades <clears throat> that have helped people not just produce power, but also get fresh water for them to drink. <clears throat> so as I mentioned earlier, I grew up on a small town in Savinal. Um, uh, my father, my grandfather, and my great-grandfather all grew chili peppers. Uh, so I guess you could say it's a very traditional New Mexican story, so to speak, because it involves chili. And um, while I was growing up, I learned about engineering inherently because of things like irrigation systems, which is like fluid mechanics. I learned about machine component design, uh, such as learning how to work with tractors and all sorts of interesting STEM areas just inherently. So some of the things that I would recommend is, is as you're going through you know, school and whatnot, you can always reflect on the things around you and realize STEM is everywhere. Science, technology, engineering, math. We need STEM in order to do and make all of these uh, things that like even produce chili or launch space shuttles. So this is one of the really interesting journeys that I've had uh, growing up. So one of the things I learned while I was, uh, while I was helping my parents farm chili was that there's been some changes here on earth and here and even in New Mexico. If anyone ever goes out to the Rio Grande and, and for those that might remember uh, back in 2000 or before 2000, there was a lot more water in the Rio Grande and over time it's been shrinking. And yes, there's, we do send water to other states so that they can have water for crops and drinking as well. But we also uh, have been having less and less water because of things that are happening to the environment. Uh, things like climate change, uh, where the overall uh, temperatures of the earth are getting warmer. 
And what we've been finding is that the various levels around New Mexico of water in our lakes, rivers, streams has been decreasing over time. And so with the scientific mindset or STEM mindset, I've been asking the question, why is that? And a lot of other people have been asking that same question. And what we've been finding is that in addition to needing the water to grow crops and use it for agriculture as well as you know our own consumption, uh, we've been finding that there are other factors that are causing uh, less and less water. We actually need water in order to run heat engines or power plants in order to produce electricity. So water and electricity are inextricably connected. You need water in order to produce power much of the time with these power plants. And when we put water after it's run through a power plant back into our rivers, the overall evaporation rate we found also increases. So there's um, an interest to figure out how we can reduce our water consumption while still producing the energy and power that we need for our everyday lives. And what we're finding is, is that uh, as the population on Earth overall increases and there's some projections that the population will continue to rise, the demand of having electricity and energy also increases. So we need to figure out ways in order to address this demand for energy in order to also sustain our planet at the same time. And what we also, some might ask is, why do we even need electricity? And so what we found is, is that as people uh, grow, are basically surviving and thriving in different locations around the world, especially in developing countries, uh, the use of energy looks a lot different than when we, what we see when we flip a switch on our stoves or our lights or anything like that with electricity where incomes are higher. Uh, we find that people tend to burn a lot of different biomass in order to produce heat, in order to cook and do various things, or they burn kerosene in order to have light. And what we're finding is, is that as, uh, as people are doing this, there's a lot of repercussions such as indoor air pollution and all of these negative things that could be bad for people's health. And so we do want more and more people to have access to electricity, but do it in a way, again, that is also sustainable with the environment. Because we also know that as more and more pollution or greenhouse gases, as some might say, and carbon dioxide, methane, and so forth are emitted into the atmosphere, it creates this kind of blanket that causes what we call re-radiation effects that also overall heat up the earth. So we need to figure out ways to reduce this impact of greenhouse uh, gases so we can reduce the overall environmental vulnerability of countries, especially those at the equator because of climate change. Uh, when I was at Berkeley, I had this professor, uh, Professor Dan Kamen, who helped also get a Nobel Prize for his work in climate change, uh, where he taught, told us and showed this picture that I'm showing right here, that if we were to actually produce enough solar energy for a given area of these little black circles that I show on the map, we would have enough energy to provide humanity all over the world with clean electricity, um, basically for the last hundred years, the last century, even up to now. And so this is very profound because it shows the potential impact that solar energy can have on all of our lives. And again, it's not just using solar for producing electricity, but also for certain things like simple cook stoves as shown here in this picture on the left. Now for New Mexico, this is even more important because the solar potential has the capability of not just producing power, but also building our economy because the concentration, so concentrating solar power doesn't just produce energy right, in the form of electricity, but it could also use the heat to do industrial processes such as making cement and desalinating water, again, for water consumption. And as scientists in renewable energy, we tend to look at these little maps like you see on this bottom left where you can see my cursor, where these are called potential maps, energy potential maps. And you'll see in the western, uh, southwestern states of the United States, the potential for solar energy is high to make electricity. What this means is if you get a solar panel and put it in New Mexico, 
and take a similar solar panel, the same kind, and put it in, say, New England, we will produce more electricity in New Mexico with the same solar panel as that of the one in New England, because our solar potential of watts per meter squared, so power per area, is much higher in New Mexico. And what we're finding with our research is that we can help with these newer technologies that are more efficient, drive the cost down so more and more people can have access to uh, renewable solar energy uh, at a lower cost. Now for concentrating solar power, um, many people think of solar photovoltaics when they think of solar energy, where you get these solar panels and you have what's called the photoelectric effect where uh, solar energy comes in as photons and then goes out as electrons or electricity. In our case, we use all of the heat from solar energy to drive uh, power systems that drive a turbine, that drive a generator to make electricity. Um, and with concentrating solar power, we have this unique advantage other than solar photovoltaics and PV, where we can store it for up to 15 hours. What that means is that in the mornings when everyone wakes up, as you see in this bottom right plot, uh, we all turn on our televisions, we turn on our coffee makers, our stoves to eat breakfast and all of that. And then we go to work or go to school. But uh, this period when we're all going to school and going to work is when the sun solar energy is at its peak, when we're actually producing more heat because that's the middle of the day. And what, what happens is we then go after work and school, we come back home and we turn everything back on. And so the demand of electricity goes up. So how can we take this little hump right here and move it to this camel's hump where you see these two other ones so that way you can spread out the energy when we actually need it. The answer is using storage, thermal energy storage in this case, where we can actually store the thermal energy in the middle of the day and then continuously produce power with it even when the sun goes down. And so with concentrating solar power, the way this works is you have all these mirrors that reflect light uh, from these, and these types of mirrors are called heliostats, helio meaning the sun, stat meaning stationary, since it has a single stationary pedestal. So this mirror is able to rotate off something that is stationary. All that light is reflected onto the tower. So imagine a bunch of magnifying glasses reflecting all that light to this uh, tower, what we call a receiver, where all this molten salt, molten uh, basically liquid salt absorbs all of that heat and then is able to store it into two tanks and then send that salt to what we call a power block to turn a turbine, to, to then turn a generator, as you can see with my cursor, to then make electricity. And what we're finding in our techno-economic analysis is if we can hit six, watt, six cents per kilowatt hour, we are less than your electric bill that you right now have. So that more, again, a lower cost per uh, energy means more people can have access to that energy. Now there are different pictures here that I'm showing of different power plants throughout the world. These ones are in Spain, this top one's in Spain. Uh, these other ones are actually in Nevada and in Arizona that show power towers, as we call them, with uh, all these heliostats uh, shining light onto a mirror, these onto a receiver. These are actual pictures of these power plants. We also have these dish systems, which are more concentrating and modular forms of concentrating solar power, as well as these parabolic troughs, which we call line focus uh, types of CSP. Now, uh, I mentioned efficiency. There's different efficiencies that we have to, as scientists, uh, understand and calculate so that way we can improve them to overall make uh, electricity cheaper and more available. So we have efficiencies, uh, optical efficiencies on work that we have to do, such as optics engineering on these heliostats. We have to do thermal dynamic efficiencies on the solar tower as well as storage. And then we have power cycle efficiencies that we have to work on with turbines. The same types of calculations that we do for turbines also extend to aviation. So if you've ever ridden on, an air, on a jet airplane, you see those things spinning, those are turbines just the same. So similar types of calculations are also done when we're producing power. We also look at concentration factors which means for a given area, so if you take uh, a, a line of three feet in one direction, a line of three feet in the other direction, you basically have one meter squared. 
And so there, and for New Mexico, I was showing earlier, for the amount of power, the potential solar energy, we have about a thousand watts of power per meter squared. Um, and so what we can, and we call that a concentration factor of one. So as we use other types of CSP technologies, we can get higher and higher concentration factors, which means more and more potential for producing electricity. These are some aerial views of these parabolic troughs that are miles long that we produce electricity. And you can see the little power plants in between all of these uh, troughs of mirrors and tubes that are uh, producing power. And here are the tanks that we actually store the thermal energy in. Uh, these are uh, power dishes where we have these engines, similar to your car engine, where you have pistons that are driven by the heat from these dishes to actually produce electricity and turn, piss and turn an engine just like in your car. These are probably the crown jewels in the United States for concentrating solar power. These are the Ivanpah uh, facilities uh, where you have three power towers. If you ever fly over uh, Nevada and Southern California, you can sometimes see these from an airplane where they produce all of this electricity on demand. And of course, the Crescent Dunes facility, which is massive. Each one of these mirrors, for any of you who have ever been in a portable classroom, one of these mirrors is the size of one of those classrooms. It's miles in diameter. And you have this 800 foot tall power tower that is what we use to produce electricity for both Las Vegas and Reno, Nevada. Now, in the 21st century, this CSP technology is going steps further. Um, I've had the honor to be a part of this a whole energy initiative to look at three different phases of matter, solids, liquids, and gases, to produce power for the 21st century, which means going to higher temperatures and higher efficiencies. Um, and as many of you have ever learned in school, uh, you have solids, where these solid particles that look like a fluid in a way whenever the particles are so small. Uh, liquids, we call those molten. This is a picture of molten uh, salt. It looks like a liquid again, it looks, almost looks like water. And also gases, where it's interesting where if you take gases such as carbon dioxide, heat it up to very high temperatures above 700 to, uh, degrees Celsius and very, very high pressures, like over seven megapascals, you start to get gases that act like liquids. As that happens, you actually are able to produce more and more energy in these turbines to produce electricity. Uh, for the research I do, I focus on liquids with these molten salts that go to even higher temperatures than the current nitrate salts. I use chloride salts. So anybody that's ever driven on the roads, especially these days in the snow and you see all this uh, red dirt, that has a lot of what we call um, uh, chloride salt that goes on the ground just, and there's other types of chloride salts such as table salt and fertilizers that when you combine all these salts together, we get a molten salt that can produce a lot of electricity. And we also get to work with countries all over the world to, that are also interested in concentrating solar power, such as this power plant in Australia that also uses sodium and metals, where we actually make the metals into liquid and use that to produce power just the same. Uh, we're doing a lot of interesting research as engineers. We get to do all of this costing and really exciting design work to produce these little diagrams like you see on the right to figure out how we're going to produce the power. And as engineers, I also get to, as a mechanical engineer, I get to also design with computer-aided design or CAD, these really neat uh, design work uh, and engineering drawings so that way construction companies can go and build these sorts of things. Uh, we also use particles, as I mentioned, such as these fluidized particles where we take all the particles, we make it really, really, really small, and then we make curtains of them where the solar energy is incident on these curtains of particles. They absorb all this thermal energy, and then we get to put them through another type of power plant just similar to the, the other ones with the liquids to produce electricity. We can also store the thermal energy in these fine particles, even like sands, that can absorb this thermal energy for even greater than 15 hours of thermal energy storage. This has the potential for really changing a lot of things, even when the sun goes down, that we're still using solar energy. 
Uh, this is a picture of one of those, uh, this falling particle receiver that we test on our solar tower. You can see the high concentration here uh, when all the sun is shining on this little power plant. As mechanical engineers, we get to design these types of structures uh, and you learn a lot about that when you get to college or your senior year of high school uh, to produce all of this electricity and make these really impressive structures that can also be used for other applications, even beyond energy. Uh, here's some more pictures. You can see this curtain. The particles are so tiny and so pushed together that it almost looks like a single metal sheet, but these are actually flowing particles uh, coming off of this top hopper. Um, for any of you have ever uh, gone to Dave and Buster's or these different uh, Chuck E. Cheese places and you've used these little chips that like bounce and bounce and bounce as you drop these little chips down these uh, little uh, shafts. Uh, we also do the same kind of thing with particles on these what we call chevron looking geometries for helping to keep the particles from falling so fast so that they can absorb more and more energy for producing power. Uh, the other phase of matter, uh, gases, as I mentioned, what we can do, such as with carbon dioxide, is heat that, that gas really, really high and put a lot of uh, pressure on it, and we can actually produce electricity as well from these supercritical gases. Here's a picture of the engineering design where we could store all of that gas after the sun goes down and still continuously produce electricity uh, long into the evening. We've done a lot of research and chemistry work uh, looking at different types of gases uh, such as air, helium, and steam in addition to carbon dioxide to see which ones can actually have the highest system efficiencies as well as the lowest costs. Because again, cost is important for being able to allow more and more people to have access to it. And finally, the other item that we can use uh, concentrating solar power be, or concentrating solar energy beyond even just making power or electricity is to use all that heat for desalination. So for any of you who have ever gone to the ocean and gone out and swam, you'll notice that the water there is really, really salty. Now in uh, on land, uh, for us land lovers, uh, if you drill down deep enough in the ground, we get to what's called the aquifer, where we get our water for consumption and for swimming pools and all sorts of different things. Uh, but if you go further beyond the aquifer, you get to another almost big lake where we call uh, brackish water reserves, where you can actually get more water, but it's very salty. It's not as salty as the ocean, but it is still salty. And so what we do is we can take up that water and we can do what's called brackish water desalination. And this type of desalination is important because as more and more states and locations get very dry, <clears throat> we want to be able to desalinate that water in order for us to have more uh, to drink. And so uh, there's a lot of research work we do in solar thermal desalination in order to produce not just power, but water. So now I'm going to take us all on this virtual tour of the NSTTF. So this is where I work. <clears throat> um, these are the heliostat mirrors that I showed you in that first picture at the very beginning of my presentation. You can see that we have very, very many mirrors that are all around us. And um, whenever we're uh, getting ready to test, we do some research on these mirrors in our optics lab, where we can use different types of virtual reality and various uh, instruments to figure out ways of shaping the mirrors to make them highly concentrated onto, a, uh, onto our solar tower. Now, if we go ahead and just move a little bit closer into the tower, <clears throat> or at the base of the tower, I should say, you can see here, we're looking now out to the heliostat field. Here are my uh, colleagues that I work with at the solar tower and friends. And we're basically getting ready to set up for an experiment. Now, inside the solar tower, this is a one of a kind facility. 
where we have different levels where we set up experiments that we're going to use this heliostat field, produce electricity and energy and all sorts of different things. Um, but we have different levels that we set up experiments. You can see some of my colleagues here on the radio working their radios to coordinate with other people. Now, in the middle of our solar tower, you might be asking, what, why is there the big old empty space here? Well, um, <clears throat> the middle of the solar tower actually has a giant elevator that is three stories and over 100 feet tall that goes all the way down 100 feet below the ground um, whenever we're setting up experiments and then can go all the way to the top of tower, which we'll see in just a second. Now, <clears throat> Uh, let's see. If we show some of these uh, different videos, we can show the, the, ener the generators that we use in the solar tower. This is one that was used to be on a battleship that we actually brought to the solar tower to produce electricity. Um, you could also see the chains here in the background uh, that actually pull up that giant elevator to the top of the tower. Now, if we go up and look up, you'll see that there are many more stages that go all the way to the top of the tower and you'll see these various silver piping, and I'll talk about those in a second, that also help to transport uh, liquids to the top of tower, such as molten salts. <clears throat> Let's see here. So we'll go ahead and head up uh, the tower. Let me find my little uh, picture real quick. Actually, we'll just go right here. So now we are on top of the solar tower. Uh, from the top of the tower, you can see all the way to Santa Fe if you were uh, able to come over to Sandia National Labs and you could see all the way down to Socorro. It's a very high area, like I said, over 300 feet tall that you can see so much. And you can now look down and see all of the entire heliostat field. Um, and just to show a little picture of the heliostat field, um, if the little video will get started, here we go. Okay, because I'm having a little technical difficulty right now, so I won't show that video. But you can see all the solar tower uh, facilities or NSCTF facilities. We have our parabolic troughs. Uh, we have our uh, solar furnace, which we'll, we'll go over to in just a bit. And you can see some of our other manufacturing where we do our welding or our shop work. Uh, so that way we can build our experiments for uh, testing. Now on the top of the solar tower, we have a test stand here. Uh, and we also have a giant falling particle receiver. Uh, this is the one where we have those fluidized particles that fall. They're very tiny particles that are all connected together that fall. And we use concentrating solar energy uh, to heat them up and then uh, produce electricity. And there I am up here fixing one of the pucks. Uh, they look like hockey pucks that uh, cover up these screws and bolts because if the solar energy hits those bolts, they actually get really hot and they can actually turn into a liquid just like molten salts and metals. So we need to protect them with uh, ceramics. And so let's uh, go ahead and go over here and let's see if I can get this video to get started. Here we go. So this is going to be a little video, a short video of one of the tests that we do at the solar tower. And I'll kind of talk us through it. So here's our mirrors. They move in different shapes. <clears throat> and you can see how they actuate during testing. This is my colleague, Josh Christian, talking on the radio. <clears throat> this is where we use our calibration panel. This is where we got ready for a simple test uh, that we wanted to do at the top of the tower. These are my colleagues that do welding. This is our calibration panel as we heat it up to get our flux level. Getting ready to set up our test article. This is a little uh, sheet that we're testing to go to very high temperatures. This is for a receiver material test. <clears throat> You can see how much power the sun really has when we actually do these tests. It's incredible. And you use infrared imaging to also see how the dynamic nature of heat 
can pass through these materials. <clears throat> So this overall shows the amount of power that is capable, but it also allows us to do thermal dynamics and uh, thermal energy research to assess different materials that could go on these receivers, see if they will hold up to these very high temperatures. So when we're done with an experiment, we bring it down and we do post-test characterization. This is something that scientists have to do to look at how things warp or deform. We also do research for forest fires. We take a tree that we can model in our computer aided design and we understand, we instrument it with thermocouples and all sorts of instruments so we can understand how these trees, as they burn under different levels of flux, how these trees will ignite and fire and then how we can see how forest fires work. And that's just using concentrating solar power. You can see that there's so much potential with all these various applications, even just with energy or other modeling that help keep people safe and keep our environment also more sustainable. This is just yet another application space that we do our research in heat transfer and thermal dynamics work. So we will go back to our, uh, let's see here. We will go back to uh, the top of the solar tower. That's our little video here. And you can see uh, this is the test stand that we did that test. And here are those uh, hockey puck looking uh, ceramics and the little test stand with some shutters that we can also do other tests for materials, including those for aerospace applications. Now, the other place that I'm gonna show is our solar furnace. This solar furnace has a single dish uh, we use different types of gases. Uh, this is one of uh, my interns setting up an experiment with nitrogen gas, uh, where the way this place works is you have concentrating solar light uh, reflecting off the surface of one of these large heliostats that passes through an attenuator. So all that light passes through this uh, shutter that look like little blinds that uh, open and close. And when they're completely horizontal, all the light passes through reflects off this dish over here and onto uh, this little target. Um, whenever uh, we get ready for experiments, we have people in our control room. Uh, we all uh, basically huddle in here, look at our computers and instruments when we do a test, make sure we're out of harm's way because that light is super hot as we just saw in that video just a second ago. And so we need to be protected in the control room when we run tests. Uh, so when we do run tests, you'll see the little stage going up. You see the light passing through, reflecting off the stage, and eventually it makes its way over to the stage where we actually run our experiments at high flux. <clears throat> so uh, whenever we do run a test, you can see the mirror, you see the attenuator. Attenuator means something that can be varied in terms of the light, you see how it opens and closes, and this helps to allow light to pass through to that dish. Uh, there's a lot of engineering that goes into this design work, as well as other trades work, such as welding and machining, that's important to build these sorts of experiments. And uh, that's kind of on the control room. We have a lot of uh, equipment, such as high-speed cameras, that we set up that can uh, operate at a million frames per second. So if you ever taken a picture with a regular camera or your cell phone, those don't go that fast. These ones are million frames per second. So you can easily see things like hummingbird wings moving and droplets of water pouring off of a little spigot. So the final place we're gonna go is our control room when we're actually testing at the solar tower. Now, uh, when we test, we have various people in the control room uh, looking over engineering schematics, radioing to the people in the test tower. And we also have the test director leading all of the different 
uh, people and various uh, activities going on. We have all these computers running to um, evaluate an experiment. So uh, I will go ahead and share this little video here. This is Josh Christian, my colleague, running uh, the test tower operations. This is one of the test engineers, Iliostat Brader. And this is getting ready for the experiment with the fallen particle receiver on the top of the test tower. So if we zoom over just a little bit, uh, we also have other facilities that I'd like to show you real quick. Uh, this is our solar uh, simulator facility. We use little lamp banks where we test all these little different materials in concentrating solar light behind you. <clears throat> we use different types of light bulbs for doing this. <clears throat> Excuse me. And we use these big lamps, these big lamps that really concentrate light, similar to our heliostats in the sun, but do it in a very controlled manner, down to a very small spot size, about one inch squared, to actually evaluate heat on very tiny materials, as you can see here. Uh, we have to use gloves and what we call personal protective equipment to also keep our hands safe and keep us safe as scientists when we're doing these experiments. We use a lot of different types of computers and different types of software that we build ourselves in order to run our experiments. So anybody that likes to work with computers, this is really a good place for you to work. Uh, another place that we work, especially for chemists, is our uh, solar thermal reactor systems and thermal energy storage facility. So this is where we have welders that are building uh, different experiments and machinists that use different types of tools for building things. Um, we have, uh, here's another picture of one of those welders welding up big big pieces of metal uh, for receivers that are going to go on the top of the solar tower. Uh, we have um, construction engineers that oversee the construction with various people building different experiments at different stages. So you can see that all here with all the videos. And um, here they are walking through here. Uh, we do wear lab coats sometimes, especially when we have things that could splash onto us. We don't want to get our clothes dirty. Uh, so it's important, again, to have the right uh, equipment and things uh, that, uh, on ourselves. So that is effectively um, the, by my presentation as far as the tour. Um, one of the things that I'd like to go back to my original presentation here is that there is a lot of solar potential on Earth. And a lot of things that I've explained to you about uh, that we can use concentrating solar power for in the 21st century for producing electricity, for using the heat, for doing solar thermal desalination. Uh, we can um, actually do a lot of forest fire testing. We could test materials for aerospace for such as space shuttle tiles, nose cones, aircraft tiles, and so many other things with concentrating solar power technology or CSP. Uh, there's a lot of work that needs to be done, and I encourage you all to consider STEM as a career, as well as the various opportunities it can provide. For, since for me, it's provide, allowed me to travel all over the world, run experiments, and talk to people in various languages to set up energy so that way we can all live very healthy and happy lives. So um, I, in, I guess to uh, close, opportunities abound more than you think with more and more education, especially if you go to college and get degrees in STEM, science, technology, engineering, or math, you'll find that there are so many different things you get to do, whether it be doing policy, floating around in microgravity, or setting up big concentrating solar power facilities, you'll get to do so many really exciting things. And, no matter what happens, always get try to give back and never give up. So thank you very much uh, for this opportunity to talk to you all. And um, yeah, just see if I guess there's any questions or I don't know, Dave, if, if uh, I guess what the next step is. Sure, no, that was amazing. Yeah, I, we were uh, definitely enjoying it on this end over here. <laughs> that is super cool. And I, I really appreciate your story, your, your personal story about, you know, learning 
uh, STEM in other fields, quite literally, I guess. But, uh, you know, it, and then moving on, I think that's really cool. That is really cool. I, I kind of come from the same background uh, from construction to teaching here. So um, if you do have a couple questions in the chat, I don't know, uh, like, how do you keep the mirrors clean? Uh, things, you know, if, you, if you've got a minute to, yeah, um, to check those out. I don't know if you can um, see yeah. the chat where you're at. I'm not seeing the chat, so if you don't mind. Uh, oh yeah, I can just ask you the question. Yeah, if that's okay. Yeah. Um, so the the first one I see here, which I guess would be the last one because I'm going backwards, but uh, is how do you keep the mirrors clean? How often do they need to be cleaned? Uh, and how often do they need to be replaced? Great question, because uh, what we found is that is where concentrating solar power and solar energy typically works really well, as I was showing that potential map earlier, it tends to be in the southwestern states of the US. Uh, if I go back over here, uh, much of the places in uh, New Mexico where you see all this high potential are generally kind of deserty, dry locations. And if we expand that to the world where solar energy potential is high, it's along the equator where you see the Sahara Desert and you see all these other deserts that are occurring along the equator. So there's not a lot of water. So how do you clean mirrors when there isn't a lot of water? So there's a lot of research we're doing in adding these coatings to mirrors. So that way the dirt that builds up on them uh, doesn't stick. So the dirt just kind of, uh, it, it'll touch the mirror and then it'll just roll right off. So there's research to add coatings so that the mirrors themselves inherently stay clean. We, when we do have to clean them, however, we do use uh, at least once or twice a year, a wash truck that actually goes, it's a special type of wash truck that has these nozzles that gets really close and cleans them. We're actually doing research on drones. So the drones actually have a little payload of water and they clean the mirrors, but use an infrared camera to figure out which mirrors are uh, dirty enough to be clean. Because what we found is that although even there, there might be a little bit of dust that builds up on the mirrors, a little bit of dust actually doesn't make that much of a difference in terms of their ability to reflect light. But however, over time, you do get some grime on there and eventually you do have to clean. So we are using different types of tools so we can reduce the amount of water while still keeping uh, these uh, mirrors clean, such as infrared cameras with drones, and all sorts of other really interesting technologies. That's awesome. I, I wouldn't have thought about all the science involved in just getting the mirrors clean. <laughs> yeah, there's That's a lot cool. more. Yeah, that yeah something cool. as simple. <laughs> yeah. Um, okay. The uh, Kobe asks, "Is this a is this the facility I've seen looking down from the Manzano Crest?" Ah, good question. So. If you're up on the top of the Manzanos, let me find my little picture here of the solar NSTTF. In the background, you could sort of, if you squint, I apologize, it's kind of picture, you'll see some little mountains in the background. Those are the Manzanos. So yes, if you look north from the Manzanos, north uh, west, you will see the facility when we test. Uh, it's a little bit small, but you could still, you can kind of see it. Awesome. Um, uh, another question is, how hot does it get in the power towers? <laughs> I love that question. This is one of my favorites. Um, in the power tower, we use all this concentrating solar, uh, these light and all these mirrors to reflect light onto a surface. Um, the temperatures that it can get up to are higher than 3000 degrees Celsius. Now, there's different types of units. There's Fahrenheit, there's Celsius, there's Kelvin and Rankine. Now, 3000 degrees Celsius means that it's much higher temperature in degrees Fahrenheit, probably higher than 5000 uh, degrees Fahrenheit. So really, really hot uh, on the top of the tower on these materials. That's part of the research we're doing because, for example, when you're coming in on re-entry for uh, like an aircraft or a spacecraft, uh, you always see in the movies all this heat generating because of the friction of the air as it's coming in over like Mach, around Mach 20. And so we can do those types of experiments because we can get to those high temperatures of like 3000 degrees Celsius 
or higher. That is, that's insane. <laughs> yeah. And for um, reference, yeah. yeah. And for reference, the sun is between 5,000 and 6,000 degrees Celsius. So we're pretty close. We're getting up yeah. there. <laughs> yeah. And so that's, I mean, I, yeah, that, that blows my mind. Um, I, yeah. I was, uh, I was going to say that you use, I, I noticed you said you use ceramics and things and melting bolts off of now and and then you saw we saw the picture of you working on the tower. Is yeah. is there do they have a way of cooling it down before you get up there, or is it just like a Raiders of the Lost Ark? You just <laughs> melt when you're there. Or, yeah, how does that work? Great question. We actually do have impressive cooling systems on the solar tower. In fact, I will go back to the little uh, video here. I'm going to go to the top of the tower. And we're going to kind of zoom over once it finally loads. I have to let it load for a second. Uh, but we have very impressive cooling systems with all this piping for actually moving uh, not just water, but like refrigerants. Like you'd have like kind of like antifreeze or antifreeze on steroids that we can use to cool these very uh, high temperature systems. That's crazy. That's awesome. We have, uh, Bonnie said that seeing it in person is even more awesome. As a teacher, they attended a summer program called Power and yes. they were able to visit the facility out there. Um, that sounds cool. I, I need to look into the summer program called Power. I'd love to go out there and see it myself. Yeah. Um, and then another question is, uh, how do you stop the kind of paraphrasing here? How do you uh, stop the birds from flying there other than uh, their <laughs> roasted chicken before they. Yeah, yeah. We don't want any roasted chickens or roasted <laughs> turkeys on our, uh, <laughs> in our facility. So we do uh, do some research to uh, what we call avian glare um, uh, research, where we do these different, where we use different types of technologies uh, and, and um, different types of um, uh, how shall I say, sensors for detection of birds so we could send out a loud noise to make them uh, kind of move away from wherever the beam is. In the past, they used to basically put all these uh, heliostats all focused in a standby position. So before we put a beam onto the tower, we put a beam somewhere just in the air. And so let's just say I put a beam way over here in the air. In fact, uh, let's see if I can get my slides to move. Uh, you, yep, uh, let me just go back here. You can see those beams in this picture here with this power tower. Well, before we put it on to the tower, we'll put it just some point in the sky. And in the past, when we had it some point in the sky, that's where all those beams would be. And sometimes birds would fly into it and they would actually combust. What we've done <laughs> since then is we've actually, instead of putting one single beam in the sky, we put multiple beams in the sky. Uh, which are less concentrated. So when the birds fly towards those concentrated points, they don't actually turn in or they don't combust or go into fire. Uh, they just get a little warm and then they fly away. So uh, bird deaths have actually gone away with a, a different type of standby configuration and with these sensors. That's awesome. That is awesome. It uh, looks like as far as questions, that was about it on the questions. Um, I have to say, I... Uh, personally, really appreciate you. I, the material is awesome, and your energy uh, is amazing. So, I mean, it made it. Uh, I mean, I was engrossed in just the material, but the energy that you put into it, I really appreciate that. Uh, it's that's wonderful. So it was great, a uh, great presentation. Um, I do have two new messages. Let me check and see. Oh, there are people saying this is cool and thank you. Uh, there's a lot of cool on here, even though you're dealing with heat. Uh, but yeah, there's <laughs> there's a lot it's of cool. Hot. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, very hot. This is not cool. This is hot. This is very hot. <laughs> like half as hot as the sun. Yeah. Um, so yeah, so there's a whole lot of people saying thank you. Uh, we really appreciate this presentation. That that was uh, you are top notch, and this material was amazing too. So. Well, my pleasure. I hope all those that are watching this, if you're ever interested in engineering, if a farm boy from Sabinal, New Mexico can do it, so can you. So I hope to see you all out here. We do tours 
year round. I know we're in COVID right now, but once things open up, we do tours all year round. So I invite you to come to Sandia National Labs, to our National Solar Thermal Test Facility and see it up close in person. We will definitely be doing that. We will. Uh, well, again, I really appreciate you uh, and your presentation. We are recording this so we can get it um, to schools and to, you know, we want the work you put in, we want to make sure that we are spreading that around. So if that's okay with you, uh, this will be on YouTube uh, and we'll send everybody links to their stuff so you can share it too. Um, this, uh, you've got some comments saying hot, hot, amazing. Uh, so <laughs> good, um, good. yeah, that is, that is really neat. I really enjoyed this. Uh, so thank you very much, sir. I'm going to go ahead and get everything ready for the next uh, webinar. And you have a wonderful afternoon. Again, I really appreciate your energy uh, and I literally and, and, you know, as a pun, I guess. But uh, that was wonderful. Thank you, sir. My pleasure. Thanks for having me and have a good rest of your day. All right. You too. Take care. Bye-bye.